before that happens. Joining me now is Cliff Albright. He's the co-founder and executive director of Black Voters Matter, and he joins us now to talk about the ongoing fight to protect voter rights. Cliff, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Listen, I'm smiling because I'm happy to have you on the show. <laughs> but the truth is, some of the news headlines that we see are really concerning. It's It feels like it's not an exaggeration to say that this is a throwback to the 60s with Republican efforts across the country to suppress votes. And a lot of people wonder, how could this happen today? Can you talk about some of the efforts to limit the vote in places like Georgia, Florida, Texas, and just generally, how did we get here? Yeah, well, you know, in terms of how do we how do we get here? I think um, one, two, couple of things we got to understand. One, it's a long history of how we got here, right? It hasn't been a steady road towards voting rights. We've had ups and downs. We got a Fifteenth Amendment back in eighteen seventy. Then we had a hundred years of Jim Crow. Then we had the Voting Rights Act. So it's been an ongoing struggle. That's part of how we got here. More immediately, how we got here. This is actually the tenth anniversary of the Shelby decision. That's a Supreme Court decision ten years ago, which um, got the Voting Rights Act. It took away the pre-clearance aspects of the Voting Rights Act, which meant that previously there were some states and counties and parts of states that before they could change any voting laws, it would have had to have gotten pre-cleared through the Justice Department. That was a good way of catching bad stuff before it actually became law and before people like or organizations like ours or individual voters would have to sue the states about the changes. That was taken away 10 years ago. Fast forward to two to three years ago in the presidential elections, of course, we all know what happened with the big lie. And so you saw a whole of uh, the big lie being, you know, Trump's excuse that there was massive voting fraud and and all of that. And so you saw a bunch of states, not just in the South, you saw um, really in every almost every state, some attempt to, to pass voter suppression bills, things that would make it more difficult to vote, that would take away or impede our freedom to vote. You saw them attempted in about 49 states. You saw about 19 or 20 states actually pass restrictive voter bills. Those were things like making it harder to vote, uh, vote early or to vote absentee or taking away drop boxes or like in Georgia, taking away or criminalizing organizations that give out food and water to people that are waiting on long lines, even when those long lines, which is absurd because of the state action. Absolutely. Absurd, which is absolutely right? absurd, by the um, way. And so. Yes, definitely. And so um, and, and but that wasn't even the worst of it. The worst parts of it was the ways that they made it easier for states, particularly uh, Republican led legislatures to be able to take over uh, county level board of um, board of elections or board of elections officials. And so what you could see happening in some place like Georgia is, I don't know, say Fulton County, which is where Atlanta is, which is where the most of the black voters in the state are, that the state would be able to take over the Fulton County Board of Elections. Or, or maybe it would be a smaller county, because at the end of the day, in these close elections, you don't have to take over the biggest county just a couple of small counties, right? When when these vote margins are, are 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, even just impacting one county and taking over their elections board could make a difference. Those are some of the most dangerous pieces of the, the wave of voter suppression that we've seen over the past two to three years. Yeah, so Cliff, it sounds like you are describing to me a game of chess and not checkers, that there are people who have been intentionally planning, plotting and strategizing the ways that they are going to take power by any means necessary. Um, you recently co-authored a piece in the Sun Sentinel comparing young activists of today to the civil rights movement. Tell us what you're seeing. In terms of like um, some of the successes we've seen, and particularly with young folks, right, because uh, like you said in that article, we talked about how there would have been no civil rights movement without young folks. Without young folks, there would have been no Birmingham movement, all those images that we saw of children being sprayed with fire hoses and dogs. Truth they be told, even in way. Selma, that there, there would have They've led the way. Uh, 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 the the sit-in movement, right? The lunch counter sit-in movements. Those are young folks, college students, right? And so today's the same. So when we look at 
uh, the Black Lives uh, Matter, when we look at Ferguson, when we look at the George Floyd protests, people being in the streets literally for three, four months at a time, that was largely young folks. And what we've seen is that when we yes. respond to young folks in terms of policy, when you when you do student debt cancellation, when you pass federal legislation that has the largest investment in climate change that the country's ever seen, when you when the Justice Department actually indicts the, the police officers that murdered Breonna Taylor, something that the Kentucky uh, Attorney General refused to do, but that the, the Federal Department of Justice did do, when you see when young folks see that happening, guess what? Young folks will increase their turnout. So when you respond to young folks issues, when you respond to black young folks issues, then you see that they get engaged, they get more active, they turn out the vote. And, and as I said, they, they don't just turn out the vote because we believe that power isn't just about voting. It's about how are we building power throughout the year, showing up at city council meetings, showing up at, at protests and sit-ins, all the things that we do to stay informed and stay engaged. It goes long beyond just election day. Yes. And I would love to talk more about how you do that. What do you do after Election Day? But we're going to take a very short break. And when we come back, we'll talk about mobilizing as a unit. Stay with us. You're watching.